Hi everyone, Brian Hotzik here with NCSI. Today I'm gonna to talk about Neurons for Dex. This is a great cloud-based remote management software from Avanti. A lot of you have used previous Avanti products like Endpoint Manager, for example. Uh, they were fantastic on-premise pro uh, products, but as we extend out to the cloud, this is kind of a reimagining of it. The same kinds of features, you know, inventory and remote control and patching and pushing out software uh, can be accomplished with a cloud-based tool instead of on-premise. Now, uh, Endpoint Manager has been around for a very long time. It's gotten very mature over its uh, over the years. We are taking those features and putting them up inside of Neurons for Dex. Now, uh, what is Neurons for Dex? What, what does that mean, right? Dex, digital experience. You're gonna start hearing a lot more about that in the industry, and it really is kind of the concept of saying, you know what, we need to understand what our users feel. What is their experience using the technology for our organization? Um, oftentimes it's not as good as you think. Our users have very tough experience with that. So we're trying to shift the perspective and say, I really care what their experience is. You know, things like, you know, are, are, are their day-to-day -day life being impacted? Is their computer running slow? How many tickets have they opened up this month? How many blue screens have, has their computer had in the last week, right? These are things I wanna bring together and really shift our strategy around managing these devices. Turn it into a lot more proactive. We are really in a very reactive state. We wait for something to happen and then we maybe reach out to the user or take some kind of action against it. You're gonna hear in the our bots section where we're doing a lot more proactive things. There is a way that you can get this product kind of individually broken out. And I'm gonna go through those uh, individual components. Like for example, our neurons for healing or our neurons for workspace, et cetera. But there is a bundle that brings them all together and that's our neurons for Dex. If you're an existing Endpoint Manager customer, uh, go ahead and click this link and watch a webinar that we put on that talks about a migration strategy from an existing Endpoint Manager uh, customer. But if you're a net new customer, that's okay as well. We'll just walk through it. You don't need to worry about that uh, watching that video. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Again, let's go through the individual components. Um, we'll start with the Neurons platform, move over to Workspace, Edge Intelligence, talk about healing discovery, et cetera. Um, let's get going. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the very first part I wanna talk about, and that's the edge intelligence component of our Neurons for Workspace. What's great about it, as you can see on the screen here, one of my favorite parts is this visual map. I can actually get and understand where our devices are. Even if I started zooming in here, I'd get down to even GPS level, even street level if I wanted to. Um, I can see real-time information down here in the bottom of those devices. And what's great about it was when I click on one of these devices, it's actually doing a real-time query to this device. That's really something we didn't do very well in previous generations of products. We use an IoT protocol called MQTT that makes it very efficient, very fast on the network. It doesn't matter that we're gonna be querying thousands of devices this way. But notice what you see on the screen right here. This is our um, quick splash page about one of our devices. Look, I can see the CPU information on it, how much memory that it's consuming, its internet latency, its uptime, its battery health, um, drive space, things like that. If I've been a technician, this is a great view to kind of start looking at, hey, what's going on with the health of that device? You know, and as you can see this, at a glance, I can try and understand more about it. Oh, I get it. I, internet latency is probably not the problem that's causing this user to call in with an issue today. The reliability index is relatively high. They're connected hardwired to something, so it's probably not a Wi-Fi issue, right? So this is a great way to get that experience of our user right from the get-go. If I go and click on it right here up at the top, it opens up a, a more deep dive into that machine. So for example, here you can see things like, you know, general information, who's logging into it, what's the serial number and so forth, and what's its digital experience score. So this is that DEX score that is trying to summarize the sentiment of our user, right? Um, if the user's calling in and they're having a problem, it's great for a technician to say, well, is the machine having maybe lots of issues? Or is this just one of those users that maybe needs a little bit of extra help associated with it, right? So I can look at this value right here and then make a judgment based on it. Okay, 68, normal. When this user calls in, I'm gonna kind of treat them normal. But if they called in and this was a 22 and it said they have lots of problems with their machine, I might take some extra time, so a little bit of extra TLC to fix this particular machine because otherwise they're just gonna call back right in, right? Um, it tells me I don't have any warnings on this particular one, but if we open up, we can see we're gonna check other things like our device insights, security insights, and so forth. You know, maybe it's missing patches. Is it, has it had boot degradations in the last 30 days, uh, blue screens, things like that. All of these are gonna affect that score going up or down. 
Um, I can even go back over here and, uh, on my uh, home dashboard. It actually even brings out to me and tells me, hey, you've got some uh, devices that are maybe not having a great experience with that DEX score. So right here, you know, some are in the normal range, but these are 83 are critical. Someone should go take a look at and understand why these are having problems. So we're going to bring that information to you. You didn't have to do anything to, uh, to understand more about it. Okay, so as we scroll down here, um, or if we go back up to overview and we scroll down, you're going to see more information, performance information, you know, CPU and memory, and number of tickets that they've had opened, um, you know, storage space, kind of things like that. Over here on my right-hand side, I've got all the different actions that I can take against the machine. For example, I could go and uh, create an incident, have it go call out to our neurons for ITSM, the ticketing system, in order to create an incident or update an incident associated with it. This is where you can see I can integrate with other technologies like that endpoint manager technology. I'll show you how this works a little bit later, but there I can command it to install a endpoint manager package, or I can install my own application from here. We'll get into that a little bit later as well, how I could you know, push out 7-zip or something like that execute a script, maybe I need to run something on that machine, um, and then remote control and agentless remote control. Remote control is very straightforward. I just simply press this little play button right here. What it's going to do is it's going to open up a, uh, you know, again, it's just all web interfaces right here, nothing, no plugins or Java or anything like that. Going to reach out to that machine. Um, oh, in this case, it looks like that machine is uh, not powered on. Let's just go grab a different device from our pool here. Um, and we'll see what is uh, available for us to remote control. Okay, this one right here, we'll be able to remote control. All right, so our remote control uh, is, has been around for a very long time. It's a very mature product. Um, you can control it either asking for permission from that device or not asking for permission. That's, uh, that's kind of your choice. Um, and then when you're remote controlling, you do things like you know copying files, running things with administrative privileges. Um, and so forth. So uh, let's see, this device should be on. Over here on the right-hand side, we're going to have uh, that remote control. So we're going to press on it and see what happens. Um, while we're waiting for that to load, notice there is another button right here called agentless remote control. Well, what would you do with that? Well, you want to have an agent on your devices, right? The, the company-owned machines. But there's plenty of times, you know, my mother calls in. She needs help printing. I don't want to install an agent on our computer. I just want to do a one-time remote control session. So I would press that. It's going to pop up and say, okay, I'm going to give you a code. You could copy the email instructions or even have it open up via email um, and go out uh, to that user. We do a one-time remote control session and then we essentially disappear um, after the fact there. Okay, so here we are. We are remote controlled into our machine. Down here at the bottom, you can see I can press a control alt delete. Uh, to go log into this particular device. I can open up the file transfer window, have access to the hard drive. Maybe you need to copy a file down or, or uh, download or upload a file. Uh, next to it over here, we've got remote execute. What's great about remote execute is you can see right there, we can execute the command as, in this case, the local system. So the local system has the correct privileges. They're, they're, you know, it's an admin essentially, right? So when you go and check that box, whatever I were to type in here, if I go and say, yes, let's run the command prompt with local system with GUI, on the far side, what's going to happen is even though a normal user is logged into it, an administrative command prompt just popped up right there kind of behind it. So it makes it easy for us to uh, execute those kinds of commands. Now, sometimes you want to do it as the actual user. That's fine. You can do it as a logged in user right there, but oftentimes they don't have uh, privileges associated. Kind of things like, you know, going full screen or stretching the screen or shrinking it, uh, things like that, chatting with our users uh, back and forth. So uh, remote control is part of the Neurons for Workspace uh, package. Very easy to, uh, to use, as you can see right there. Okay, let's jump back over here. We're looking at this laptop. We can understand a little bit more about it as we go through and troubleshoot it. We might want to know um, maybe what its status is. You know, I've got a phone call from a user, and that user says, yeah, my computer's running really slow. What can I do about this? Well. I just showed you remote control. And to tell you the truth, that is a very common tool that I want to go grab and say, well, that's going to show me what everything's going on. I'm going to go use that. But I want you to take a step back for a minute and say, well, what would be an alternative path to do that? The reason being, you can see remote control, you know, remote control takes you know, a few seconds to set up. You might have to minimize their windows. Maybe you have to close out of it or log them off. You know, I can actually pull the performance up here. And I'm looking at essentially task manager remotely on that machine. But it's not task manager, right? It's just a web page that I'm looking at. If you look close, you'll see it actually is going to refresh every, you know, I don't know like, like 10 or 15 seconds. And I can even expand these out. And look, I can go and even uh, stop one of these uh, processes. I can go and kill it as part of, uh, you know, my troubleshooting action. Or if I go to the services tab, same kind of thing. I can scroll down here and say, oh yeah, you're having a problem with printing. I get that. I can see your print spooler. 
you know, is not running here, let me go ahead and start that. So I'm actually sending a command to the machine to start whatever random service I picked on there, and it'll actually report back whether it can start or not. I don't know if that service can start, but that's kind of the concept behind it. Um, uh, oh no, it actually came back and successfully says, yep, no problem, I started that service for you. Look, I can also go and um, run the network console, like run an IP config. Again, I'm not using a remote control here. I'm executing a command on the remote machine, it's rendering the results and bringing those back to me and showing it my browser here. So I can say, oh yeah, your problem is your DNS suffix down here in the bottom, or you know, I'm troubleshooting, I'm gonna go and try and ping Google from your machine. And it's reporting back, oh yeah, no, your latency looks good, that's probably not the issue that you're having. So I'm using tools to troubleshoot that machine without even necessarily have to remote control it. I can also go and do an, intelli uh, an edge intelligence query where I say, well, I wanna know something about this machine. I need to know about its hardware. You know, what's going on with its battery health? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? Do I have to replace this? Um, tell me about the operating system. What, you know, are there any unexpected shutdowns that have happened in the recent, uh, you know, in the recent history? So this is where I'm interrogating one machine. But if we take a step back and say, well, if it's happening to one machine, is it happening to my other machines? So if we go back over here, let's go back to that map view that we were kind of looking at at the start. Well, up here at the top, look, I've got a little box to type in a question. So I'm gonna use a natural language engine search here to try and find something. Like for example, what if I wanna know about disk encryption? You know, my boss just came in and said, hey, we've gotta make sure we're doing disk encryption on all of our devices. Um, well, I didn't use the word BitLocker in this context because we support multiple operating systems, right? This uh, product works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, we use FileVault over on the Mac side. So when I say disk encryption, here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna do a real-time query against my devices. It's actually gonna be changing as it queries because it's doing it real time, watch this. So I'm gonna press enter on that. It says, oh yeah, you meant desk encryption. I support PC and Mac with this particular query. And then here's the results of that. Red means no disks are encrypted. Green means a disk uh, is encrypted. So uh, this is a graphical view of it. If I click on it, it'll switch over to the list view. I now am looking at a filter applied saying no disks encrypted. Sure enough, I've got several different devices down here. You know, this machine has BitLocker and it's not encrypted. This machine has FileVault and it's not encrypted. We've got to go do something about that, right? So I can simply interrogate. That's all I want to do. Great. I can, uh, you know, call it done. Or over here on the right hand side, look, you can actually have it go and turn on BitLocker. Now, this is a part of our automation that we can actually go and say, yes, I want the task to be done to be enable BitLocker. To tell you the truth, it's not incredibly complicated. I would just go in here and say, well, how do you do it? Oh, BitLocker, you could just enable with a uh, PowerShell module. So here enough, right there, enable BitLocker, you know, runs this command on that machine and, and away it goes. So that example is relatively straightforward, but you can see we've got several other items in here. When you say add another task, you know, block a port in the firewall, disable fast startup, turn on the firewall, turn off the firewall, notify the user, log them off, restart the machine, send an email, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We can create these quick actions to go do something. Other ones you can ask for, like, uh, what about local admins? This is where I'm saying, I want you to tell me when you find a local administrator that I don't really expect to be there. Like a domain admin, okay, that makes sense, but you know, why is there this machine right here and the username called Archimedes is on there being allowed as an administrator? I don't like that. I'm gonna go and remove them as local administrators over here on the side. So you can see that context always changes depending on what kind of query that you asked for. If I query about the firewall status, same kind of thing's gonna come back. Oh, well, yeah, hey, you've got a bunch of different devices. Some are on, some are off. Well, here's ones that are turned off is disabled by domain policy, or these ones are just disabled, let's go and enable it or disable it. Same kind of thing, I've got those contextual actions over there to the side. Now, if you don't know what question to ask, not a problem, look down here in the bottom. We give you a bunch of examples of how to create different, um, you know, different functions. So, oh, you wanna know about uh, FileVault? Great, let's click on that. What about CPU utilization? Oh, internet latency? This is a fantastic one. You got a lot of work from home people out there, well, what if they're complaining about their internet speed? You, you don't even necessarily know about it. Now, my users don't have huge problems. The, the, the worst I have is good, but hey, at a minimum, it's gonna come back and give you that information, let you make informed decisions based on that. Uh, again, maybe we should proactively reach out to these users if they have bad internet latency uh, to try and help solve their problems. So we're gonna deal with that a little bit later when we get into our neurons for bots. 
Okay, so that was just an example of what you can ask for. Again, notice all these samples we have down here on the bottom. But one of my favorite features of this is one time in the early days of this product, I went up here and I typed in a question. And I thought it was a pretty straightforward question. And it came back and says, I have no idea what you're asking for. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of lame. Okay, well, and I moved on with life. And then I logged in about a week later and a little bubble popped up down here in the bottom. And it said, hey, last week you asked me this question. I had no idea what you meant then, but now I do. Do you want me to run that query for you? So it, it improves on a very, very rapid basis. So I really like the edge intelligence to get that very real-time information um, back uh, from our systems. Okay. Uh, next, let's move on to the uh, Neurons for Patch. So Neurons for Patch gives us the ability to apply uh, uh, patches to our workstations, right? That's relatively straightforward. Now, a couple of things you need to know about this, though, is Neurons for Patch is technically an additional license outside of Neurons for Dex. Neurons for Dex is almost always put together, and most customers get both, but do know that they are separate line items, Neurons for Patch versus uh, Neurons for Dex. Okay, so uh, let's go jump in here and let's go create a new configuration for patching. So this is where I would go and say, hey, I wanna patch a certain subset of the machines that I have in my organization. Let's just say, let's go and do our corporate laptops for argument's sake. So I wanna roll out my patches to my corporate laptops. How am I gonna go and do that? Now, again, we talked about uh, supporting Mac, Windows, and Linux. We'll go through one at a time. We're gonna start with Windows here. You can see we can deploy based on severity. Doing it based on severity is incredibly common. Most organizations have some kind of policy around something like that. Hey, if it is a security critical or a security important or a security moderate, we wanna push it out within 30 days or you know whatever, whatever your logic is behind the scenes, um, we can support that. So do it based on severity. So in my example, it would be that. Security, critical, important, and moderate, we're gonna roll out. Notice we can do non-security patches. You know, it's a big argument on whether it's valuable to do non-security patches. I don't want to get into that heated debate. I just want to tell you, you can choose to do non-security or not if you don't want to. Next, we can do it based on a patch group. This is where we're picking individual patches. Look at some of my uh, groups down here in the bottom. I would select this individual version of Adobe Acrobat. Look, Acro Read DC Upgrade 230082, you know, I am hyper specific with a patch. Now, I found in my many, many years of patch management in the workstation space, I haven't found a huge need to get that granular. Most customers are just like, nah, security critical, high and medium, just get them out there. But if you want to, you can choose to be that hyper specific. Notice up here at the top, we have two options, include and exclude. So you can use it in kind of varying functions. Number one, you could use it as an exclusionary option. I want to do everything above automatically. However, if an item shows up in this list, I want to exclude it. So I have marked this list as an exclude. The opposite of that is an include, right? I would go up here and say, I want to include this group of patches. Now, quick note, you don't necessarily need to have a group and include it if you're also doing these up here above. It's, it's kind of redundant, but you know, again, the nuance will be at your organization. You can pick the exact specifics on how you want to do it. Or you don't even have to do that at all. Some of my customers are like, no, it's workstations, whatever. Just patch out there, get them out there. So uh, lastly, we do it based on vendor. Now, we support patching a whole pile of third-party applications. The Chromes, the Firefox, the Javas, all the things that you would normally expect from a third-party patching tool. And um, I've selected all of them. Yes, go ahead and patch all of these. But you know what? Sometimes you've got, maybe you're a Java shop, and there's this one version of Java that really breaks a bunch of stuff. So you might go down here and say, well, yeah, I want to go into Java and I want to turn off Java 6. Whenever you find Java 6, don't go patch it. It's just going to break stuff, so don't turn it on. Or maybe you want to turn off all of Java. You know, that's fine as well. This is where you can selectively include or exclude our individual vendors uh, from the list. Lastly, should we reboot after deployment? Well, should you always reboot or only reboot when required? Um, you know, obviously your choice. I'll show you our reboot logic a little bit later um, at our agent settings. Okay, next let's go to Mac. Mac's very similar, not a huge amount different. They don't break out the vendors as much um, as we do on the PC side, because Apple actually provides a lot of the patches uh, through their ecosystem for the third parties as well. But, you know, relatively similar. It's so slightly different around, you know, patching, should we always force a reboot, um, you know, things like that. Linux is fundamentally different. Um, we do have uh, a concept of uh, contentless patching, which is just deploy all missing patches. Think of it like going onto uh, you know, a Debian-based box and say, apt get upgrade, right? It just upgrades everything. 
um, versus doing individual uh, patches for this. So it is a different kind of mechanism um, when you set out uh, to do limits. All right, lastly, we talk about the recurrence. How often are we going to go and uh, patch this? Now, up here at the top, we've got run and reboot. You know, this is a really interesting um, option because sometimes we've got problems where machines don't wake up enough. They've got a desktop computer in the office and they've got a laptop in the bag and they don't get the laptop out of the bag as much, right? So should you run it on reboot if schedule's missed? I scheduled it every Tuesday and they missed the schedule because they were powered off. Should we wake up, next time we wake up, should we run it? Well, that's your choice, turn it on or off. It's just uh, 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 an individual setting for each organization. Then when should we deploy our patches? So deploying our patches could be, you know, daily, down here, I can pick the schedule. I could do it weekly. I could do it monthly. You know, on the third Sunday of the month or the fourth Sunday, Saturday of the you know whatever. Um, so lots of different options that we have. But then also Patch Tuesday. Now we patch more than just Microsoft patches. That's all they do on Patch Tuesday. But you know, most of my customers are on a monthly cycle anyway. Why don't you tie it to the largest patch release uh, of the month? So uh, pretty popular offset there. But we can actually have a delay after. Patch Tuesday. I like this because um, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't want to race and be the first person in the world to apply a patch. Why don't I wait five days? In five days, this patch has been rolled out to millions and millions and millions of machines. That's a, probably a pretty good test for us, right? So um, in my example, I just do it at five. Uh, I don't want it at uh, midnight, you know, so maybe let's change that to, uh, uh, you know, noon. Notice we do local time, so if the machine's in a different time zone, that's okay. We can also stage the content before we uh, deploy it. Stage is the fancy word for copy. Hey, let's copy the files out there. If you're doing it every Saturday at whatever o'clock, you know, it seems like a waste to then start downloading at that time. So we're gonna download them the day before, have them sit there in the cache, and then wake up when we're actually uh, in charge of patching and start rolling it out. Down here in the bottom, you can see uh, we have a big breakdown of what's gonna happen upcoming. Okay, July 13th coming up here, we're gonna start copying stuff out. Then we're gonna wake up the following day and start deploying it to Windows, Mac, and Linux, et cetera. So you can see all the different um, options that we have at our uh, uh, disposal. All right, so uh, that tells me what's gonna kinda happen here in the future. Um, I would go to the Associations tab here next and I'd say, well, who's gonna receive this? I've called it corporate laptops, that's pretty big and generic, but you know, I'd go select the policy. Oh yeah, it's this policy or this group, and we would go define that in our neurons policy section um, of who's actually in there and receiving it as well as like the history of what's going on and how many times we've kind of created this uh, kind of a thing. All right, so I would uh, go and apply that configuration to a set of machines, um, but then I would also be able to understand how the, the compliance is working. You know, my organization is, is shooting for a goal. That goal is security critical, important, and moderate within 30 days, or you know, whatever your SLAs are going to be set to. Now we can come back and we can measure ourselves against those SLAs. So I would go in here and say, okay, uh, who do I care about in this particular report? What is our compliance threshold? What's the service level agreement time window where this is the period after an undeployed patch is considered out of compliance. So I can tweak this however I want. I can say who I want it to apply to. Um, you know, again, maybe I don't care about certain patches. I only care about critical, important, and moderate. I don't care about lows and unassigned. So, you know, they're not necessarily gonna show up on, on, this, particular, um, on this particular report. I'm not gonna save that, I'm just gonna revert it. But let's give ourselves a little bit bigger time scale here. So, you know, I might want to know, hey, how we've been going for the past six months, uh, give or take, something like that. Down here at the bottom, um, we can now go and see what is our compliance over time. You can see, um, I'm not doing a very good job. Look at this, you know, uh, come here in May. I was at 35% compliance. That's terrible for patching. Well, what's going on? What's, what's the reasoning behind that? Down here in the bottom, we can look at it and we can say, well, yeah, I've got this machine right here working like a champ. Absolutely doing great. It's in compliance status. So is this one down here at the bottom. But you know what? This one has no scan data. I need to assume the worst when we have no scan data. We have to assume it's completely out of date until proven otherwise. So that's really hurting our score. But if we want to go into some specifics down here at the bottom, we can actually say, well, what about this machine? There's no reason this machine should be out of compliance. It's, you know, it's a good, healthy machine in our organization. Tell me the reasons and the logic behind the scenes uh, here. Well, sure enough, down here in the bottom, it tells you why. There's something called Zoom Installer. It was released September 5th of 2023, which as of today's date, that's 308 days ago. So that's well beyond my 30 day window. And look at that, it's a security important and look right below it, I've got a security critical, same kind of thing, it's a Zoom Installer. 
So this is why I'm now not in compliance. Now, sorry, quick uh, comment. I keep my machines out of date on purpose. It's very boring to show off a bunch of machines that are all patched. So that's why mine are out of date. But you know, in a normal healthy scenario, these wouldn't be showing up, but there they are, right? Hey, I need to go deal with these. Uh, matter of fact, look at that. This vulnerability right here has several CVEs associated with it. It's, this is a problem for me, you know? Um, I'm nervous that these CVEs that are, you know, very critical are, are gonna uh, cause a problem. I can understand more about the patch. Okay, here's the 64-bit patch, here's the 32-bit patch. Um, uh, who are the other devices that I have? Oh, nobody needs this particular patch because it's actually been replaced. Well, let's go talk about patch intelligence for a second. How do I gather information about what's going on in the world of patching? I don't have all day long to, to sit around and watch every patch webinar and read every document that's created around patching. I want that information brought to me. So this is our patch intelligence. Um, you know, what are the top vendors that are releasing vulnerabilities out there? What are the largest patch types? Uh, what happened this last Patch Tuesday and so forth? As we scroll down here, we can look at the individual vulnerabilities. Well, hey, what, what's going on with this one right up here at the top? Let's dig into that. Oh, it's a security update. Well, here's the individual patches for a bunch of different operating system types. Let's go take a look at our CVEs. There's a really fascinating thing going on here that we've got to talk about for a minute that's going to help your patching um, prioritization. So everyone's familiar with a lot of the terms that we throw around, like severity. What does severity mean? Critical. Oh, OK, well, yeah, critical and important and high. Aren't they all kind of the same? They're a little bit confusing, right? Because they're, they're synonyms of each other to some extent. So the industry created this thing called the CVSS score. It was a mathematical representation of the severity, 0 being the lowest, 10 being the highest. So as you scroll through here, you're like, oh, yeah, a 9.8. That's super high. I should panic and go deal with this, right? So it was hopefully meant to convey a lot easier understanding. But it wasn't perfect, so we went through a couple of iterations with it. We finally arrived at version 3. And again, this is an industry thing, not an Avanti thing. The CVSS version 3 scoring is a way to give a number to a vulnerability of how much risk there is associated with it. Okay, great. We've, we've solved the problem, right? Not quite. As we scroll through here, I want you to highlight something. Look at something that might draw to your attention. First of all, what does this say over here under exploits? Vulnerabilities are really fascinating. They're usually a theory. Someone could potentially break into the system. But until an exploit is actually published, it's just an academic exercise. But then sure enough, look at this. This machine, this vulnerability right here had an exploit published and it has something in it called privilege escalation, PE, meaning they could be a regular old user, non-administrative user, and they're breaking out of their privileges to gain administrative status. That's a big problem for us. RCE, remote code execution, they're hitting us remotely instead of having to have physical access to the machine. So we now know these are exploits that are out there. What's the problem with the CVSS score? The CVSS score never changes over time. But we know in the real world, it absolutely changes. So think about it for a minute. There was a big huge ransomware attack last week, right? At some big healthcare organization. What's absolutely hilarious about this is even though it's gonna be a recorded video, that's probably still gonna be true for the next many years because ransomware attacks are just keep happening, right? It's a very big problem. Now, this one right here, actually has a ransomware associated with it. Shouldn't you be paying more attention to a vulnerability that was used in a ransomware attack last week? Shouldn't that be higher on your radar? It absolutely should. So notice what we did here though. The CVSS score, this is what the industry, not Avanti, but the industry has said. That vulnerability started as a 2.6, which is really pathetic, but now it's a 6.5. But what Avanti has done is we've created a different rating system. We layer on top of it called VRR. This is the vulnerability risk rating. We rated it as a 10. Do you see that? Very top. Absolutely stop what you're doing and panic and go patch this. Because there's ransomware associated with that. The CVSS score doesn't change over time. It doesn't give me insight to what I need to be doing in the future. So we actually have an entire vulnerability lifecycle product called risk-based vulnerability management. This is just a teaser of what you get out of that. Um, uh, if you want to know more about that, click the link over here. You can hear about our risk-based boulder management uh, video as well. Um, okay, so now I know about these patches. I've got to go and deal with them. I've got to go and patch it. Well, in this example, I actually don't have any devices that need this. 
Because I was looking at all patches on the entire planet. I'm going to slide this slider bar over here to say, no, for the next little bit, only show me stuff that is just, uh, you know, my environment. So now down here in the bottom, I can see those. Like I can see the actual individual devices that need patches that are outstanding and so forth. I could go and report an issue. Hey, I, you know, this is a problem for me. Uh, it causes uh, blue screens is what I'm going to say on this particular message. I got more than uh, 100 to 1,000 devices that are causing blue screens, right? So now it gives feedback to Avanti, a little bit of crowd strike or a crowd uh, sourcing of uh, the way that we find out issues with uh, some of our machines. Okay, uh, after that, I can go back and take a look at my endpoint vulnerability. This gives me a little bit more insight into those devices. Um, you know, tells me which machines I need to be worried about. You know, right here, hey, this one's got a risk score of 93 because it has a large number of missing patches, um, you know, outstanding on it. So what is the health of those particular devices? As well as the deployment history, you know, show me the actual mechanics. What did we do? When did we do it? Who did we apply it to? Was it a success? Was it a failure? All those things are uh, going to roll through in here. All right, so that was a quick run through on our neurons for patch. Again, just a quick reminder, it is technically an additional licensed element inside of our Neurons for Dex uh, uh, technology, but it, it's not a different product. As you can see, it just kind of um, uh, shows up here in the rest of the ecosystem. We just need to make sure we have that license component. Now, one of the things that's kind of at the base layer is our uh, agent framework. So we've got to talk a little bit more about how our agent policies work. These affect lots of different components. The patching I just talked about, that edge intelligence that we started with, Etc. All of these things are going to show up in uh, in the agent framework. So we can go and create uh, an agent policy. I'm just going to go modify an existing one right here. So here I've got my hot uh, test policy. Um, you can see I, these are all the different modules that I can turn on. So like for example, we haven't got to it yet. We'll talk about discovery in a little while. But if I choose to have active discovery enabled, I check that box, and now it's enabled in this particular agent policy. You know, can the user see anything? Do I turn on the agent UI? Is there a connector server? Are we using application control from the UWM suite? I just enable or disable whichever options I want to uh, turn on or off for the particular agent. Here is the agent settings. If we open up that, you can see it has a lot to do with the downloading of binaries. So uh, especially when we're talking about a cloud-based solution, let's say I've got 500 workstations at a single site, and I need to push out a patch to them. It would kind of stink if every single one of them had to download that, you know, 500 times. So here we can have peer download. We can have it be client, meaning I am allowed to download it from my neighbor. Server means I'm allowed to serve it up to my neighbor, share it with my neighbor. And client and server is both. Um, I love client and server. Just, you know, those 500 machines, just turn client and server on. It doesn't matter who downloads it. We'll just randomly, you know, shuffle that around. Or if you have a little bit more of an infrastructure at that site, oh yeah, we've got a file server there. Sure, go turn on server only and have it be the server. It doesn't have to be, be a file server. It could just be a, a workstation that's there and almost always powered on. And then everyone else can be, you know, a client. We also do throttling. This is just traditional, you know, hey, don't chew up the entire bandwidth of our connection with uh, downloading. Let's dial it down a notch. And here I, I put 25%. Especially the fact that we're downloading our patches 23 hours in advance. Who cares if it takes five hours to download a patch? It's not going to affect a user. They don't even see it, anything like that. Next, we've got our reboot experience. This is where we interact with our users when it comes to actually rebooting. So we could wait till they sign out. You know, that's one option. Um, my personal preference is to be a little bit more aggressive with that. So I would like to reboot after an interval. So, you know, here we've got a countdown timer. I can change that. Duration display the shutdown message. I'm going to let my users postpone it if I check this box. How many times can they postpone it? Not up to a number of times, right? For, for how long and how many? Um, down here, can the user uh, defer it until sign out? You know, that's an option that we have. And then can the user cancel the reboot? So um, I don't love that last option just because <sighs> I'm even in the patch management industry myself and I will click cancel if it pops up because I'm just like, oh, I'm bored. So. Uh, just kind of rem remember, it, they're going to be very aggressive at uh, canceling that. So you may want to turn that off. Okay, lastly down here in the bottom, it doesn't really talk about what I want to talk about, so I kind of have to go roundabout for a minute. Um, but this is talking about agent automatic upgrades, and what should we do in the reboot of that? Now, agents are the worst. Let's all just agree with that. Has anyone ever said, wow, I love agents, they're fantastic, let's get more of them? No, they are a means to an end. So the agent in the neurons platform 
was redesigned from the ground up to eliminate most of the headaches we've had in the past. Um, it is incredibly lean and light. It's 14 megabytes. That's incredibly small. It only installs the components that we want. If I don't check remote control, it doesn't even bother downloading the remote control binaries to put on the machine, let alone installing them, right? So light and lean. But my favorite part is automatic upgrade. So it doesn't say it here, and I'm not enabling or disabling the fact that automatic upgrades are gonna happen. Those are gonna happen. It's just, should we ask the user for a reboot if one of those comes in? Well, you know, I'm gonna say do not request reboots because I'm already asking the user to reboot quite a bit. If there's some new whiz-bang feature, I can wait for the next re uh, patching reboot cycle to kick in before I use it. But the beauty of it is, again, it's doing that automatic uh, upgrading for me. I don't have to go and deal with that individually. So um, again, we turn on or off all the different settings that we want, um, and then we go and uh, roll it out to our, uh, to our devices. They're going to automatically upgrade that. They're automatically going to get that policy. They're automatically going to start uh, changing it. You know, if they didn't have remote control today, you went and hit uh, turn on remote control and then hit save. Five or 10 minutes later, the machines will have the remote control binaries already installed, uh, downloaded and then installed and you're ready to go. So you're not gonna have to go and do like an update or an upgrade of that. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to, to, to work that way. Okay, next I wanna talk a little bit more um, broadly about uh, neurons for DEX, uh, specifically the discovery component of neurons for DEX. Um, we've gotta talk about what what this product does kind of philosophically for a second. Um, we have great inventory in here, right? I have the ability to go up, uh, I think I already have one up here. Let me show you um, uh, one of my endpoints. Let me find a physical machine there, a little bit more interesting to look at. Um, but we've got some fantastic inventory data in here. You know, I always like to show this one to kind of explain that. It's under memory slots, the number of memory slots that you have. Look, that's the asset tag on the, uh, memory stick in slot zero on this laptop. Very, very good inventory of that, right? So we've got fantastic inventory. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could roll this inventory up and get a lot more, right? At more asset management style, I need more. So we can go and install an agent on a device. That's pretty straightforward. You even saw, you know, uh, my, my maps that I have shown up here show a lot of my devices. But when we start thinking about it, we realize, well, wait a minute, these are, lap these are laptops and desktops that my users are using. These are not everything, right? So we've got to talk about, well, how would I get those other components into uh, you know, some kind of tracking system? So the, the idea behind it is, I want to put all my information into a repository, right? And that repository up here at the top, we can have some debates on what that is, but it also could be a CMDB slash asset database um, that uh, Avanti has, and it would give us the ability to um, have that be the, the final destination. Now, we don't have to have that be in incorporated. That's technically a different conversation uh, than we're having today, but the rest of the elements are going to be true. So uh, here's a problem that we have today. The problem is we have far too many silos of technology. Let's talk about some of those silos. You, uh, most organizations have some of these. Uh, Active Directory, right? Active Directory is a fantastic information for user data, but if you start peeling back the onion and looking at device data, Active Directory is actually junk. It doesn't tell you the serial number. It doesn't tell you um, anything about uh, the device like uh, its service tag or you know uh, who's currently logged into it. It's actually not that great, but there's a little bit of data there. We should care about it. Maybe use some other uh, on-premise technology like uh, SCCM. You know, pretty good at workstations and servers, but doesn't know anything about printers or routers or mobile devices or things like that. Oh, maybe you're starting to get into Intune. Okay, Intune's an interesting platform. It's, it's a lot better at those workstations um, and those desktops and laptops and mobile devices, but you know, it doesn't know anything about cloud stuff or again, those infrastructure things. Um, maybe you're using uh, Neurons for MDM, our, our MDM tool, or uh, VMware. That could be a uh, on-premise tool that you have that you store a lot of your server's uh, information in. Maybe you have uh, Rapid7 or Qualys or Tenable, a vulnerability scanning tool that's out there. It's got some interesting insights into data, but it doesn't have a perfect picture. It doesn't know about anyone's house or any remote machines that we have, things like that. Um, other components, maybe you're starting to get into the cloud. Maybe you have Azure or AWS uh, VMs that are running up there and uh, how are you keeping track of those and where they're coming from? 
The gist of it is we've got a large number of data sources and not one of them we ever consider a source of truth. So what can we do about this? What we're going to do is we're going to have our neurons for discovery be a aggregator of that information. We're going to create what's called a connector to these various data sources. So I connect to them, um, usually like through APIs and things like that. That's how we're going to talk to them. And we're going to ingest information up here. These are usually arrows going up. We're sucking up this data from those data sources. Um, but we do a couple of interesting things when we park it inside of our data lake. So the data lake is kind of where we hang on to that data, manipulate it, uh, and so forth. Take a look at this for a second and um, think about how many times a server would show up. You know, regular file server that you've got. Well, it's probably going to show up in Active Directory, probably in SCCM, probably not in Intune, probably not in MDM, but yeah, probably in VMware. Oh yeah, Rapid7 is going to gather it. I mean, I'm going to find it five times. Whenever you're dealing with creating a source of truth, having duplicates really erodes the trust. And you need to have a lot of trust when it comes to a source of truth. So what we're going to do is we're going to dedupe this. We are going to run it through an algorithm that understands how devices get duplicated, what their uniqueness is, is. You don't need to worry about any of that. You just need to know that it's happening on the back end. So it's OK that you know we have a device that shows up in multiple locations. Now, we have a really crazy benefit that's an offshoot from that, reconciliation. How many times have you heard this? I'm almost guaranteeing you've heard this at your organization or previous one. Hey, why does Active Directory have 1,000 devices, yet ICCM has 800? What's the difference between the two? You know, isn't that been asked before? It just proves we don't have a source of truth because, you know, we, we can't reconcile between them. So I'll show you how that reconciliation works. Um, I've had some customers buy this product just for that one thing so they can tell the difference between those data sets. The next thing we're going to do is normalize. Um, whenever you're doing this, does Having Dell, Dell Inc., Dell Computer Corporation, Dell EMC, I don't even know what their name is these days. Um, having five different spellings of Dell help anyone out? No, it doesn't. So normalization is going to clean all that up. Have a single copy of Dell instead of these. All right, so these are API style communications in order to discover, but we need to do traditional discovery. So how does traditional discovery work? Well, I've got a subnet. Let's just say for argument's sake, this is my 192.168.2.x subnet. This is a, a location I have. It's not my primary headquarters, just one of my branch locations there. Now, I've got a bunch of devices. So I have a device and I have installed that agent out there on at least one of the devices out at that location. And I've checked the box that says I care about discovery. You saw that was in our agent settings there. Now, here's what's going to happen. We are going to take an entire, entire copy of the database of the, uh, uh, our data lake there, but only the MAC addresses. And we can store millions of MAC addresses and even just a couple of megabytes, so it's really not a big deal when you think about it. So we store the MAC address table on that one machine right there. Then we tell that machine, I want you to do two types of discovery, an active scan and a passive scan. And they are fundamentally different from each other, but they usually have the end, same end goal. What we're going to do with an active scan, it is, is, it is going to reach out essentially to every IP address on the subnet looking for devices. You know, I'm going to sweep from dot .1 to dot .254, whatever, you know what I mean. Um, and if it finds a device, let's say, hey, we found a hit right there, it's going to probe it. It's going to do uh, OS detection. So it's going to say, well, who are you? Are you a Windows machine? Are you a printer? Are you a router? Are you a switch? We're going to query them in different ways. Um, for example, if it's a switch, we've got SNMP discovery. Hey, I'm going to hit you with an SNMP community. We're going to come back and we're going to get inventory. So now I have a much more complete inventory with all of my routers, printer switches, all those kind of infrastructure devices. We don't have an agent that runs on a printer. Usually SNMP is going to be good enough for us to pull that information back. But let's say for argument's sake, um, it finds a different device that is a Windows machine and there is no agent on that Windows machine. Uh, the MAC address says, yep, I've never seen this device before. What we're going to do is we're going to probe it with credentials. We're going to say, okay, I've got a bunch of uh, administrative credentials. I'm going to send them your way. Um, if I succeed, I'm actually going to go and install an agent on your device. Well, you can technically choose whether you want to have an agent. That should not be a C, that should be an A. You can choose whether we want to have it be permanent. Um, the permanency makes it so that if that machine 
uh, leaves and goes home, we can still keep track of it. If you don't install an agent on it, eh, it may or may not come back. So that's kind of the debate. But we send our credentials at it, and if it succeeds, we report that information all the way back up through that agent, you know, to uh, our data lake. And if we've installed the agent, it will then be kept track of essentially forever there, right? So that's a great way to um, discover our devices. The passive nature of it has to do with the fact that this active scan, where we're saying, hey, go do a scan, we give it a time. We say, Tuesdays at 4 o'clock. Well, in the world of hybrid and work from home and things like that, Tuesdays at 4 o'clock may be a terrible time to do scanning. So passive scanning takes this device right here and turns it into a little bit of a narc. It's actually going to listen on this port right here, and it's going to listen for ARPs. So an ARP is a response to a MAC address and an IP address. The second a device plugs in right here or uh, associates to Wi-Fi, it almost immediately broadcasts an ARP out on the uh, subnet. Now, it's a uh, layer two broadcast, so it's not going to cross a router. That's why we care about doing it out at this subnet level. And it is going to be caught by that machine and say, oh, hey, brand new device. Let me go interrogate you right now. So instead of sitting around and waiting for Tuesday at 4 o'clock, it did it right here, right now. Now, I'm a big fan of combining our methods. We've got deduplication here. Why don't we do active scanning? Why don't we do passive scanning? Global scanning is this idea that I've got something like a server in the data center. I want it to probe out to this subnet and that subnet and this one over here. You know, so it's a little bit more centralized. Do that as well, right? Add all of them together. Our deduplication is going to make it so that it doesn't matter. We'll be able to do reconciliation and understand what has slipped through the cracks. Now, for the people that want to use this to help populate a CMDB, it's an absolute perfect way to do it. We just then take this data and go shove it up into the CMDB. I like to go and apply a filter on that first. They would say things like, well, what if we discovered an Xbox in the break room? Yeah, we can't manage an Xbox. You know, it doesn't have an agent for it. So I don't want to bring that up into my CMDB or my asset repository. We could just have a filter that says, if we don't have a serial number, don't bring it across. But you're not required to do that last step. That's just you know an optional component for some people that are using discovery to populate their CMDB. As a matter of fact, uh, remember we talked about earlier, discovery can be an, a standalone component. If you don't need all those other functions, remote control, patching, et cetera, you can get it just for its um, uh, discovery components. OK, let's jump back over there and see how we actually set all this up. All right, so here we are back. Let's go and actually set up that discovery that we just talked about. Here in the discovery section here, you can see I can um, turn on how those discovery scan works. You can see several subnets that I've created here. Let's go take a look at one of our subnets. So as described, here's my 192.168.2.0 subnet. You know, I'm give it a name. I can call this the, you know, whatever office. And, you know, here's the CIDR block. You can see CIDR and range and network, things like that. Here's the scan types. You already heard me say this. I like lots of options. I'd rather turn them all on and see what kind of chips, uh, where the chips land because I would rather have more data than less data and have something slip through the cracks. So active scan, we've already talked about that. That's that sweeping network. It's what everyone thinks about when they think about the discovery. Do an IP sweep and see what you can find. Then do OS detection. This is Nmap, trying to understand what kind of operating system it is. Not perfect, but it can go back and say, hey, it's probably a printer. It's probably a workstation. It's probably, you know, kind of whatever as part of that. Next, if it's a Windows machine, we can do that remote inventory that we talked about. Connect to that C dollar sign share, um, do that inventory. And uh, if it's a router printer switch, why don't we hit it with SNMP credentials instead, get an inventory come back uh, associated with that. Okay, so right here, who's going to be doing that scanning? We've already talked about how doing it out of the edge, there's some benefits to that. So we can say, use an elected scanner. We know everyone's subnet. We know where everything's at. So it's very easy for us to just go randomly pick one. Oh, let's pick that machine today. Oh, that machine tomorrow. Doesn't matter. The machine shuts down or whatever. We'll just go, you know, pick someone else. Or you can hard code it. You can just say, no, I want this machine right here. It's going to be the one that's doing the scanning for this subnet. So your choice. When are we going to do the scanning? Every day, every week, every hour? You know, we can just kind of control it at that method with that active scan. Um, uh, but when you go into the passive scan settings, you can see here we just need to control the way that it does its passive scanning. It's a little bit more nuanced when you get to passive scanning. Like, for example, should you be scanning at people's houses? Do you want to pick up their ring doorbell at their house when they're working from home? 
Maybe, maybe not, right? So uh, we would control whether we are turning the passive discovery on or not. Um, okay, so we go and do those scans, the machines are going to show up, and then we actually have the ability to go and install those agents um, as part of that agent installation process uh, if we want. Our connectors, we use those to connect to those kind of API style sources, right? So here's an example of some of those connectors. Um, let's talk to Adobe to pull down software information, AWS for server information up in AWS. Uh, uh, CrowdStrike for antivirus, CDW for purchasing data, Dell for warranty data, uh, Google Chrome Enterprise, Google Workspace, um, a bunch of Inventi products. It's not just third parties, it's some of our own products as well, like there's our neurons for MDM, that's our formerly mobile iron, Inventi security controls, that's our on-premise uh, 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 agentless patching tool. Down here, Jamf for Max, Lenovo for warranty information, Microsoft 365, Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, Intra ID, um, Intune, Okta, one logon. How do we detect cloud-based applications? That's sometimes a difficult thing, right? So this gives us the ability to um, talk to those kinds of devices that are those applications that exist just in the cloud by talking to the single sign-on providers, part of that. Uh, Rapid7 Qualys, again, bone by scanning tools, they might catch something that we missed. Oh, whoops, we forgot to put that server in the patching tool. We forgot to put an agent on it or whatever. Now we can catch it with one of our alternative scans. Uh, VMware, Workspace ONE, Tenable, etc. So VMware is a great connector. Um, good example of I want all my servers in the ecosystem. I want to use it to populate my CMDB, but I don't care about remote control on my servers. I don't care about patch management on my servers. I, I don't need any of that. I just want to find them. Well, I can find every single virtual machine you own with a simple API called VMware. So how do we do that? Now, first of all, this is the connector name. We'll just call it VMware. Now, this is a cloud tool. VMware is an on-premise tool. How do I get a cloud tool to talk to an on-premise tool? We have a special version of our agent called a connector server that's going to make it so that your users uh, or your, your systems can, the cloud can talk to an on-premise tool. So um, I'm just going to put it on any kind of random server that I have. It's not really a server, it's just an agent. Just throw it on some kind of random utility server that you have out there. All right, here we're going to connect to vcenter.vertrillo.local. You can see if you don't have a legit cert, you can ignore certain warnings. Put in the username, administrator at vsphere.local. Put in my password, you know, whatever. Okay, should you pull in virtual machines that are powered down? Well, that's more of a philosophical argument. I don't care one way or the other. Just pick it. I'm going to turn mine off right here. Um, and then I'm going to say I want to pull that down every day at whatever o'clock, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. There you go. Then I would save it and run it. So it only took about, what, three or four minutes there? Getting credentials is going to be the hardest part of that process. And um, from there, it is now going to pull in. All of your servers are going to show up in your inventory automatically. Again, you don't necessarily have those other functions. You don't necessarily want those other functions around remote control and so forth. But um, now that information is pulled in. So go through and create these various connectors um, uh, to all the different data sources that you have. Now we can do that reconciliation that we talked about. So if I go to my smart advisors, and I click on device reconciliation, I'm presented with all of my data sources here. I've got a whole bunch of them. I'm going to put them all in the middle. So I want to ignore all of them. And then I want to start asking questions. Okay. I want to know how many things are in Microsoft Active Directory that are missing a neurons agent. That's going to be something I want to know, you know, quite a bit. Hey, what am I missing? Well, there you go. 13 devices. It told me right away. I can click on devices. It actually picks me up and takes me over to the devices page. And it shows me, oh, by the way, here were those 13 machines that you probably forgot to install an agent on. But look at what we show you right there. We show you the number of the connectors that we have. What if you found a device that only shows up in Active Directory? You can do a lot of inferences. Hey, that's probably a stale record. I can probably go and erase that. I don't need that anymore. So gives us some great insight into it, not only showing that. So now I have an action items list. I've got to install an agent on these devices, or I've got to do, clean them up from their data repository, uh, something like that. OK, uh, next let's go talk about software distribution and our neurons for bots. So software distribution, very straightforward, gives us the ability to go and create an, uh, an application to push out to our devices. Now, those applications, like for example, we'll open this one up here. Here's 7-zip. Um, if I go to the package page here, let's just edit it so you can see a little bit more about it. We've got all the different actions, like pre-deployment actions. Maybe you need to detect whether it's installed first. We've got to go look at C program, program files, you know, whatever. And if it's there, I maybe I don't want to install this, or I do want to install it, or kind of whatever else. Next, we can download a file. So I would drag out download a file right here. 
We do have the ability to um, actually store your information in uh, an Azure blob. So a really kind of cool connector here. It's going to go talk to a container that I've created and then show me all of the files that I put up in that Azure blob. So now I'm distributing it right from the cloud very easily. So it's like, oh yeah, that's the exact file that I want. Or you can just put in a URL. Some of our vendors like here in 7-Zip, we can just grab it right directly from the source. We could have a SHA-256 hash value if we want to verify it. We just put that information in. Next, what do we do after we download it? Well, maybe we execute it. If it's an MSI, we drag out this, you know, execute MSI uh, block from the left-hand side. You can see MSIs are very easy. Install, uninstall, repair. There's different radio options. You want to be quiet, silent, no UI, additional command line parameters. We just turn all those different options. And look at that right here down at the bottom, um, in the way. Uh, our, we can do it as a system interactive, meaning it has full administrative rights to that machine. Um, we can also do it as the current user. They don't have rights, but sometimes like a plugin or something might want to be run as them. You get to choose that. Um, so I can execute MSI Xs. I could do a file operation. You know, there's a chance I need to like delete a folder from the old install before I install something new. Or, you know, I need to unzip the file before I execute it. Or let's go talk to the registry. Let's erase a registry uh, key or set a registry key or something like that. Uh, we can also just run a script. Hey, I've got PowerShell here or batch file. Uh, oh, I need to stop a service, delete a file, whatever, you know, do it as part of a PowerShell script there. So I go through and I create my uh, different steps to install this particular application. Then I say, well, who receives it? So I create a distribution. I can do it based on an LDAP group. Let's go grab it from Active Directory. I've got this attorneys group. Let's put it there. Or a device group for neurons, our own kinds of groups that we've uh, created. Or even just ad hoc devices. Oh yeah, this device and this device and this device. These are the ones that, that need it. So now I apply that, I say the schedule that's gonna happen. Oh, we're not rolling this out until you know next Thursday, that's when they need to receive this application. So I'd go roll that out. And if we jump back and look at one of our devices here, over on the right-hand side, remember I talked about how you can install an app? This is an ad hoc. I don't have to go over to software distribution just right here and say, oh yeah, they need 7-Zip, click on this button, hit install, and then they'll receive that application. So a combination of kind of ad hoc um, as well as uh, more prescribed, doing it based on groups and things like that. So that's software distribution. That's part of our Neurons for Healing. The other big part of Neurons for Healing are our bots. Now, I think I've saved the, the best for last here. This is one of my favorite new features, and it really highlights that shift from, pro, from reactive to proactive. And it's trying to solve problems that you don't know about yet, you in the help desk. So I want you to go through an exercise. I want you to open up your help desk queue, and I want you to tell me the, the top 10 tickets that are happening. Now, number one, password reset. Forget about that one for a second. I want you to think about numbers two through 10. You are gonna find a lot of funny things in that. You're gonna find things like, oh, they ran out of hard disk space. Oh, their print spooler wasn't started. Very simple little problems that the user had to get frustrated enough that it bubbled up, they picked up the phone, they called us, we got the help desk ticket, we went and emptied the recycle bin and deleted the temporary files. Why, why, why are we having that to have happen? I thought we lived in the future here. ChatGPT solves all of our problems, right? AI is on the cusp of replacing all of our jobs. Well, wait a minute, our users, when they have hardest problems, they still have to pick up the phone and call us. So let's try and knock off some of those low hanging fruit. I'm gonna go and create a bot here. And it could be for whatever. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to get you thinking about it, but um, hopefully you can come up with some that would be applicable to your use cases. All right, is this going to be scheduled? Like a disk space bot, I want that to be checking every single day. You know, let's just keep doing it. Or is it going to be a custom action where I want a human to trigger it and to wake it up and say, yes, go run this action. Let's just, for example's sake, say schedule for the beginning. Are we targeting people or devices? In this context, I care about devices more than I care about people, but we, we can do either one later. So let's go in here and say, this would be like a sample disk space bot. Let's just go create that as an example. Now, um, here I'm gonna drag out blocks. It's kind of like that software distribution that we were just looking at a few minutes ago as well. Here I can query. I've got 75 things I can ask a question about. That question could be, tell me about your antivirus. What's going on with your agent? What .NET frameworks do you have installed? What applications are installed? What's the health of your battery? What's your BIOS information? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I'm not going to read them all off, but look at how many that we have—a whole pile of questions to ask. Then 70 actions to take. Let's install a piece of software, copy a file, delete a folder, 
uh, change something in the registry, turn on a service, turn off a service, turn on the firewall, turn off the firewall, you know, et cetera, et cetera, a whole pile of actions. And then down here in the bottom, custom, PowerShell and Bash. You don't have an action that you want to do in our list? Fine, use it in PowerShell or Bash. We can accomplish pretty much anything. Okay, so now let's go back up to the start. We started with a disk space problem. How do we solve disk space problems? So I'm going to go and say, we've got a query here called free disk space. I'm going to connect it to the schedule up here at the top. I'm going to say free disk space less than 20% on the C drive. Well, what action should we take if we have less than 20% of disk space on the, free drive, uh, on the C drive? Look, we've got an action here called clean disk right out of the box. What does it do? Over on the right-hand side, it kind of tells you. Hey, on Windows, we're going to empty the recycle bin. We're going to delete the internet temporary files. We're going to delete the Windows temporary. On Mac, we're going to do the trash. We're going to do the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So now I've got that option. There's even an option right here for a different length of days. That's it. That's the bot. It's got two steps. Look for low disk space. Clean it up. Now, whenever I show this to customers, they come back and some of them say, big deal. You just went and wrote a script to empty the recycle bin. Who cares? What's the big deal behind it? I always push it back on them and say, you're absolutely right. It's a simple script. Are you doing it today? And usually the answer is, oh, well, no. Now that you mention it, no, we don't do proactive things on our workstations. We wait for the problem to creep up and come to us. So anything I can do to peel away some of those issues is going to be uh, you know, for the better. What other kinds of things could we do with this? Look at all those queries that we had. What about over here on the left-hand side? We've got one about latency. So let's say your organization does a lot of work from home. And you've got a user that goes home and they've got bad internet connection. Now, are they going to come back and are they going to tell us, well, the problem is we switched over from the 2.4 gigahertz band to the 5 gigahertz band um, when we moved to uh, uh, 802.11 AC. And a 5 gigahertz signal has less penetration power due to the spectrum length going. Th are they going to say that? Or are they going to say those jerks in the IT department make my computer run slow? Eh, I'll give you a hint. It's going to be the latter. So why don't we monitor their internet latency? I'm going to run it through a filter here. I'm going to try and talk to Google's DNS server and run it through a filter looking at the property called internet latency, looking at it being greater than or equal to whatever, you know, 900. Let's just say for argument's sake, if your latency is greater than 900 milliseconds, you are having a terrible day and you are going to not be working well. Let's talk to the user. So over here on the left-hand side, notice we have lots of options to interact with our users. So we could uh, just open up here and say, send a message. We could log a message, that's not really to our users, but we could display a message to them that says, uh, hey, your Wi-Fi sucks. Or we've even got some really cool interactions with Microsoft Teams. If you're a Microsoft Teams shop, why don't we have a bot send them a message through Teams that their internet is not working well, maybe they need to move or something like that. So check for their uh, internet latency. What about if they had a service? Let's say uh, you use VPN. All of our users use VPN a lot. So I want to monitor the service. And if it's not running, I want to restart it. So I'm going to look at the you know, VPN whatever, VPN whatever. Um, that's the service that I care about. Same kind of thing. We'd run it through a filter. We would filter the results here. I don't care if the service is running. That's totally normal. So we'd look at like probably like the status not equals to running. OK, it's not running. What action would, should we take? Look over here on the side, we've got to start a service or restart, whichever one we want to do. We would connect it to that. So now, same kind of thing. We're going to go and say, well, why shouldn't this run every couple of hours and make sure that this service is running? If it's not running, let's go ahead and, and restart it. Now, not everything we can fix remotely. Think about a hard drive for a second. It's about to go bad. I've got a laptop, got a hard drive. It's going bad. What is the workflow normally? Well, um, it's starting to slow down. The high disk latency takes forever to boot up, frustrates the user. The user's not having a good day. They're, oh, I hate this stupid laptop. It's slowing down on me. Maybe it blue screens, right? Um, it finally gets to the point where it crashes. I pick up the phone. Hey, I've got this uh, stop code, inaccessible boot device. How do we fix this? Well, geez, we're, we're in bad shape here, right? The hard drive's completely bad. Now, the help desk technician says, now, you didn't save anything to the hard drive, right? You put everything in OneDrive or whatever. You know, maybe we've got some data loss issues. We ship them out on a new hard drive. It is a pain in the neck for all parties involved. Now, how could we make that better? What if we could take a step back and say, I want to make that interaction better? There is something called Smart Health. Smart Health is a predictive failure engine inside of our hard drives. It understands bad blocks, things like that. Well, what's really fascinating, I talk with lots of customers. Nobody ever looks at this. We're too busy putting out fires. 
We're trying to do less with more. Insert whatever euphemism you want for, hey, we're not doing proactive stuff. I've heard it all, right? This is trying to change that conversation. Spend a little bit more time in a proactive state and it will lower those fires that come up here, right? So I'm gonna look at the smart health. And again, I don't care if the hard drive is working well, that's fine with me. Um, I wanna look at the property called status not equals healthy. I don't care if it's in failure, predictive failure, it doesn't matter. Not healthy equals bad. I want to know about it. Well, what could we do? Hey, look at this. I've got an option to go and create a ticket. Now, again, we can't actually go and um, uh, fix a bad hard drive remotely. I don't have a script that can fix that, but I want to know about it. I can open up a ticket. I can even go and link the CI. Look at that cool thing that we have. Link this CI to that ticket. So when they open up the ticket, the CI is already linked to it right there. So some really cool stuff that we have. So. I make this bot, I run this bot on all my machines. What's the workflow now? The user's starting to slow down. They are having some struggles that day. Maybe they had a blue screen and their phone rings. Well, what, hey, hey, it's the IT department. We're monitoring your laptop. We see your hard drive's failing. Let's get it replaced now before it actually fails. I mean, our users would fall out of their chair if we were doing that level of productivity. So now you can see bots are a completely different way to solve problems proactively. You sometimes hear about first call resolution. Did we solve the problem on the first call? This is zero call resolution. Did you fix it before they called? So it really is a, a paradigm shift. Now, um, that was just some examples that I have. If you've got uh, examples that you'd like to see created, put them in the comments down below. I can make a video and show you how to create specific scenarios. Mine were just to get you thinking. Again, go to your help desk, look at your top 10 issues. I bet you're gonna find some in there that we could uh, use as examples. We also have some great uh, uh, templates. You know, you don't have to create it from scratch. Look at that, I've got a clean disk one. It's a clean disk teams is what we're gonna call this one right there. It is that same kind of logic, but is way more complicated. Look, we're gonna go and look at free disk space, but then we're gonna go take a look in the registry and store that value. Then we're gonna reach out to the user via Teams. We're gonna say, hey, oh, by the way, uh, user, we noticed that your hard drive's full. Would you like us to clean it up for you? We present them with buttons, and the buttons say, perform it or no thanks. And then you can see different actions go down different ways. If they say no thanks, we're gonna go say, okay, no problem, we won't bug you again. We stamp the registry that, that's don't bug them again. If they say yes, we might come down here and find that, oh yeah, no, it's your downloads directory that's full. Again, do you want us to delete your downloads or are you going to do it? Look at this, if we like zoom out on this, you can see, oh, wrong zoom, let me reset that up here. But uh, if we zoom up here, you can see there's all kinds of steps that are happening here. I showed you very simple ones. You can start to create, you know, incredibly complex ones. If you choose to, you can publish these out to um, the custom actions over here on the side. Remember, we are showing a single machine up here that stops the remote control and the other various functions. These is where we have exposed one of those bots that we've created to have a human run it. So instead of a tool running it, the human runs it, right? So that's the difference between, you know, a more automatic and a more uh, passive bot. So um, that's our neurons for healing. The, the function is neurons uh, bots. I think it's gonna really change the way that we uh, support our users. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, watching our uh, demonstration today of our neurons for DEX. Um, I appreciate you uh, sitting through this. Hopefully it was valuable to you. Uh, if you would like a more personalized demonstration, we can kind of go through it more in detail, help you out with specific bots or anything like that. You know, click the link down below. You can schedule a demo with us. Uh, I'd be more than happy to walk you through it. Thanks for your time today, everyone. I appreciate it.